So welcome everybody. And today with Mustafa, we are going to discuss OWASP top 10 Kubernetes misconfiguration and security related issues. And let's start with showing my screen and then let's start discussing the OWASP top 10 Kubernetes. So I think my page is okay. If you have any issues, let me make it a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. So First issue is insecure workload configuration. So basically, let's say that it says that you shouldn't run your containers as a root user. That is very important. What if we run our containers as a root user? What is the, I mean, uh, security issue if we have a uh, the application running as a root user? Do you have any idea, Mustafa? Or I can tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, we may start with the description of the what is the meaning of the insecure workload configuration. I mean, that's the the we have the Kubernetes manifest files, and that contain a lot of different configuration in these manifest files. You can maybe explain the what is the important in this uh, misconfiguration why yeah. we are we are configuring our workloads. Yeah. Okay. Then. So first of all, I mean. The misconfiguration of the manifest file is starts with the uh, getting elevated, uh, sorry, getting rid of the root user. The first one is this one. I'm going to show you step by step why we, if we run uh, our containers as a root user, what's going to happen. And I'm going to show you uh, how I can uh, exploit the container. The other one is read only root file system. So, what if the uh, container file system is not read only? How we modify, how we can modify the file system. The other one is privileged containers. So let's start from the beginning. Yeah. Let's say Docker PS, so I'm not running any kind of uh, Docker images. So it is later the container. So I'm gonna show my demonstrations to uh, Docker, Docker run Nginx. Uh, it should be dash dash name. So I want to get, remove every uh, temporary file that is created while spinning up the container. And then dash D for daemon mod, and let's run our container as nginx. So, first thing first, if we run this container, what's going to happen? And, and let's random run. port. So, let's execute Docker PS. So, basically, I'm running a simple Docker image as an uh, in, in, in nginx. So, Docker exec, let me kick into the container. Docker exec dash it, and then name of the container, and bin bash. So the thing is, if I execute who am I, comma, in can here. Can you zoom, zoom in a little if you okay. it's possible? Okay, sure. So if I execute who am I, comment, and let's do, I think it's okay. Who am I, again, you're going to see that I'm a root user. So which means that if I'm a root user, then I have a chance to update the APT, update, and then I can install new softwares inside the container. APT update, APT install, dash Y, and then let's see the, let's say that if I want to execute KepSH, which is the helper tool for showing the capabilities of your user and your container. So app install dash Y, the cap to that bin. So basically, there are two things in here. I'm running a, this container as a root user. That's why I can execute apt update and I can install any package on my uh, environment. The other one is if I'm running as a container, if I'm running this container without root file system read only, then I can install and modify the file system of the container. So if I execute this command. I, I, I basically installed libcap package into my container. So I can, this leads to us, this two configuration. One is I'm running as root user. The other one is container is not configured with read on root file system. That's the reason I can install the, uh, the libcap to package. And let's execute this couple, kpsh dash print. And basically, it shows me the capabilities of this container. So I'm going to copy the capabilities 
of this container into Sublime. And I'm going to compare with the privilege mod container. The reason that what I am trying to achieve right now is what if I execute my container as a privileged container in terms of capabilities? What are the differences between spinning up a normal container and spinning up a privileged container? So let's exit from the normal container that I'd, I'd spin up. So let's execute Docker with the same comment with uh, privilege in the next priv dash dash privileged. Yes, that's the one. And let's execute this comment. So basically, I spin up a privileged container. So the capabilities of the container should be much greater than the capabilities of the normal Nginx compared to here. So let's look at it. Docker exact dash it name of the container Nginx priv in dash dash. So let's execute again. Who am I? I am the root user. And if I can execute apt update dash dash apt install dash y and the cap to dash bin to install capsh tool. And in the privileged container, if I execute capsh dash dash bin comment, you're going to see that the other capabilities in here. So let's copy it our text editor and let's look at the, and let's compare the capabilities of the container with the normal container. So let's search for, for example, cap this admin. So basically, let me write this one, privilege container, privilege container and it is normal container. Normal container. So again, this capability is a lot for spinning up a normal container. You should drop all the capabilities, but specifically keep CAPSIS admin is very dangerous. And the other one is module, CAPSIS module. These capabilities are very dangerous. The reason is that if I have the capsys admin capability, then because of the privilege container, privilege flag, then I can do certain things like, for example, as a normal user, as, as you can see, I am a normal user in my Linux box. And if I execute fdisk l, you're gonna see that permission denied. I cannot list the volumes of the Linux, my Linux box. On the other hand, if I click in my privileged container, if I execute this comment, of course, there's no APT installed. As you can see, because I am a root user inside the container, because I am, I don't have read-only read, read only root file system, I can install any kind of package. I can modify the file system. So apt install lit cap this one for fdisk. I should install apt install fdisk and deflect. I really like it. That's why. So fdisk dash l one more time fdisk dash l. As you can see, I can list the volumes of the virtual machine, not the container itself. You can access to the direct to the virtual machine host. Yes. Yes. So up to now, do you have any questions? You should have questions. So everything is easy, and I can see it because I am the cap. I have the capability of the capsis enemy. The other one is, let's crack the password of the virtual machine. So basically, what I am doing is a privilege contain with the using the privilege container. I'm making a privilege escalation. That is important. That's why the top three, the first one, the first three uh, configuration practices is important. So let's crack the password of the operating system. And I should install G John the Reaper to crack the password. So let's install it. 
apt install dash y drop. But what I need is I need to mount the volume of the Linux box. So basically mount. And what I'm mounting is the stb one to MNT folder, CD MNT. So right now the mount folder, I am I can list everything that is under the virtual box. So without mounting, without using the Docker or the containers or the container, these default volume mounting operations, I mounted everything from the operating system, the root file system. And as, as you can see, it is, it is a virtual box that I have, virtual environment that I have. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to etc folder and then I'm gonna unshot of these files, unshot of wd and shadow file that contains the user passwords as a salted. And I'm gonna copy it into containers temp folder with the name of unshadow. And then let's direct to temp unshadow. Sorry, it's, it's not a directory. So let's crack John on shadow. And let's wait a couple of minutes. So basically, as you can see, the first password is cracked and there are a couple of passwords in this virtual machine. So the first three is important. No root user. So to sum up for the first configuration, for the first insecure workload configuration, let's sum up. Yeah, well, well, let's 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 summarize the the first three things. The important one is the misconfiguration in our manifest files, right? The first one is the application process should not run as root. That means the user, the attacker, can access the host with the root access, right? When we yeah. set the run as user as a root, that is the maybe the most important one when our Configuring our uh, deployment manifest files. Yes, the reason is that I can install any package on yeah. the container itself, yeah. and I can do a modify the files inside the container. Containers. That is the first thing. And because user namespace, because of the user namespace of the container, there's a one-to-one -one mapping for Linux machines to the container. So if I say that user ID zero, and I do some operations, it will be a zero user on the operating system. So yeah. let's go ahead, this stage is yours. Yeah, the second second one is the, also that is the maybe the one of the most common ones, the read on the file system, using the read on the file system. That's, that's the important and we should be very careful because the attacker uh, can write back to the, our host system when we, they access with the, without the read only, so we should be careful uh, while uh, yeah the configuring yeah. So basically, read only root file system makes the containers file system as read root only read yeah. only. Yeah. So if I execute, even if I don't mount the, I mean the uh, container read on root file system, I cannot modify. So yes. I spin up the container with read on root file system, then it's going to happen. Even if I'm root, I, I will not modify the root file system. Yeah. So yeah. the other one is privilege control. That is the one yes. that's very yes. important. That's maybe the, the important to understand the capabilities of the Linux host system, because the important one is the using the capabilities while with the specific privilege containers so we should that will be very dangerous when we use the unnecessary capabilities in our containers and so we should be disallow the privilege containers uh, in our containers right the the important one is understanding i think the understanding Linux capabilities while working on the containers uh, configurations. Yeah. So 
basically, let's show that the read on root file system. I'm not modifying the Kubernetes manifest, but I can yeah. show you everything from the Docker or container D. So basically, if I execute this comment, pref2, not the pref nginx2, I will not execute privilege. Instead of that, I'm going to execute with read dash only. If I, if I will not docker execute. comment accept this parameter, okay, docker ps, docker ps dash i, I need some modification, docker, is it? Okay, nine minutes. Box next to, of course, does. Yes, record locks. So be careful about read only root file system nginx2. As you can see, if I do read only root file system, I should set other folders, not read only. That is necessary for the specific containers. So let's look at one of my examples in my Git repository. And let's go to .net .docker. You should show me something. Uh, I couldn't show it. I should sign it. Let me give me a moment and let me type my passwords. I need my again the authenticator. Just give me a moment. I'm not prepared for that. So Repositories. Pardon if I can show you. I know that it's there. Yeah, that one. So I fork one of the publicly available containers and I want to show you something specific to .NET. So for getting rid of root user, we are adding a user and while spin up, spinning up the .NET process, we set read only root file system, but with two exemptions. One is the temp folder. If the application is writing something to the application folder. So for .NET applications, keep in mind that read only root file system is okay, but not for temporary folders, you should set from the Kubernetes perspective an empty directory. I'm going to show you in the next, uh, I mean, uh, session. But this is important. Read-only root file system should be set. Root user should be removed. And the third one is, uh, what was that? Uh, privilege I escalation. False. Yeah, privilege escalation, of course, that should be the false one. Yeah. So this is later with the in-second workload configuration. Yes. And Let's look at the supply chain vulnerabilities. I should hide this one. So basically, it says that how to prevent software bill of materials. Basically, it says that you should create a file that contains the components of the container. So let's assume that I have an Nginx file or something like that. And I am extracting the container and saving a file saying that this container, this Docker image contains X, Y, Z files. That is what software bill of materials is. So, so there that, are a couple, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I just would like to say that we have a container, but that contains a lot of files inside of that. So there is a like a package with the different software. So we call is that the software bomb, right? Yeah. Software bill of I mean software yeah. bill of materials. Yeah. So let me show one of my favorites is Trivi. 
sorry, uh, trivia is again one of my favorites, but let me show you SIFT. Sift. So basically, SIFT generates a software bill of materials files for you. And it says that you can send this file to grep, or basically, you can execute grep. So let's look at it. What I mean, software bill of materials looks like. So it says that, let me, let's install, let's look at the installation file. Install SH, blah, blah. If you are on Ubuntu or if you are on Mac OS, Mac OS, whatever it is, you can execute these comments, blah, blah, blah. I have already installed it. Let's look at, look, let's look at the SIFT output. So it says that you can generate the S bomb file just executing this comment. So let's look at the Nginx one. So basically, software bill of materials file looks like this one. So if you publish this file into, again, one of my favorite tools, a lot dependency track. The OWASP dependency track will show you the vulnerabilities of the images. Again, this is the first thing that you can do centralized vulnerability management. And in the SIFT repository, it says that you can use another tool called GREP. That tool scans the R image, right? That's yes. The, all files in this image. So let's look at the grep. Blah, blah, blah. I, for the installation, it's OK. Blah, 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 blah. So the object, blah, blah, blah. This is the important part. So it says that. Yep. Next. You can either provide the SPOM file and then to the grep, or you can do, I mean, the get the vulnerabilities of the image by just typing this grep comment. Okay. That scanned the all files in this image, all we can and show us the which one is the malicious, which one is the dangerous for us, right? Yes, one of definitely. So let's look at what if we don't take care of our vulnerabilities. So Sorry. Grab CDE. So let's search for this one. Search. So there are a couple of vulnerable labs that you can execute it, but one of them is my favorite ones. That container contains the shell shock attack. So let's say that the grip, let's look at it. Let's look at the vulnerabilities of this image. And see that something like shell shock attack, what's going to look like. That shows us that it's very important why we are working, especially working on our CI/CD pipelines, right? Yes, definitely. So we should provide uh, CI/CD pipelines inside it, and we should put these kind of stuffs into our CI/CD yeah. pipelines. So let's again search for grab dash i for in case insensitive to twenty forty. I just tried it. Yes. Cool. So one of them is actually is that one. Yes, that one and that one. So what if we don't take an action if the vulnerability has high? So basically it shows you, but what if we don't take an action of these vulnerabilities? What's going to happen is there's a good resource in here. Basically it says that execute this comment. Instead of IT, I'm going to execute with the daemon. 
and pick PS. Okay. Spin up my vulnerable image in my Linux box. And it basically says that you can execute this comment to retrieve the passwd file. So I can do reverse shell attacks based on that. Again, it continues to the first one. I mean, let's look back to the first misconfiguration part. Instead of cat test WD, what if it is, I am trying to, who am I? We have to restrict the access and the capabilities, right? Yeah. Definitely, who am I? I couldn't do that, basically. Yes, the crush exec dash it. In bash, let's execute this comment. Who am I? So it is a root user. So I can do some sort of malicious activities inside this container. I can download packages. I mean, I can do everything because I have the I have the remote code execution. You can run the scripts on the host stack with this privilege. Yeah. If the container is privileged, then of course. Yeah. But if it is not, then I I do, for example, download container, uh, sorry, uh, coin mining operations to here. I can upload something, blah, blah, something like that. But it is, we should be very careful about the CVE records. If there's a high, we should understand that it is applicable or not for our container. So maybe libc contains, I don't know this one, heap overflow, but it is, let's say that it is not related with us. So we can, I mean, suppress this error. The other one is, of course, there are plenty of amount of container scanning tools outside the, the open source world. But one of my favorites is, again, as I said, is Trivi. Trivi, Azure DevOps integration. So if you want to see some sort of UI with the Azure pipelines, this guy's where are you i should find you just a second if i can find it i want to share with you yeah that one this guy absolutely written this blog perfectly and yeah i'm a good and and at the end it should be the end results scan results as well so if you want to use Chevy. And if you are using Azure DevOps, then Trivi have a feature to export the output of the vulnerabilities as a JUnit file. So which means that Azure DevOps can interpret this JUnit file and then show you as a nice report of vulnerabilities. So basically, as you can see, let me scroll up, as you can see, it shows you the vulnerabilities in the UI side. Yo. So all this dependency track and the Silondex integration is perfect. You can use by this way. Or you can integrate your Azure DevOps pipeline with Trivi. Or you can use grab just to see you. Or you can extract and upload your SPOM and Silondex files to anywhere. Yeah. So these are the very important uh, steps for our Kubernetes clusters before deploying anything to our environment. Yes, maybe one, one of the most common forgetting things is that scanning the device before deploying in the pipelines, right? We must not forget to put a scanning step in our pipelines mm -hmm. because in time uh, we our image has going to big and has a lot of layers a lot of files in this image and that's one of them may be malicious for the for our application for our workload so we must uh, put a scanning step in our pipeline like you show in our devops pipeline with the tv and see the results and inter that should interrupt the uh, deploying uh, the applications to the, our clusters yep so let's continue. So it says that constant utilizing this solid scratch is okay. Everybody knows that why the source continues because it's a slim image or scratch. It is uh, very slim images. Clear trivia. I mean, we just mentioned it. 
But there is a very interesting topic in here. Enforcing policy, pre prevent unapproved image from being used with Kubernetes submission, blah, 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 open policy agent, key value, reject workloads. So basically it says that, okay, right now I deploy something on my Kubernetes cluster. What about the compliance of your Kubernetes cluster? What is compliance? So for compliance is you have some sort of rules. You either, with these rules, you either audit your environment or you deny if somebody tries to deploy something uncompliant. Let's assume that I have a server and my compliance says that you cannot deploy or install SSH server with the username password authentication. Only authentication method is certificate authentication. Then this is something that for this is something for me is a compliance. So open policy agent and Kiverno is for compliance of your Kubernetes clusters. So let's say that. I have a policy and I don't want anybody to mount the host path. So who is going to prevent me to mount the host path? So let's look at this code. What if I mount the host path etc folder? Again, I can crack the password. Who is going to audit me? Who is going to prevent me to do that? This is why Open Policy Agent and the implementation of uh, Gatekeeper or Kiverno is implemented. So basically, you deploy Gatekeeper or Kiverno onto your Kubernetes cluster, and it starts to audit. If needed, you can configure to deny it. So this is, again, very important features. So let me show you my, in my environment if I have I'm going to show it from Azure portal. Sorry for that. Uh, just give me a couple of seconds. I have. Yeah, that one. So. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. Can you see my screen? So it's I deployed. Azure policy, which is implemented with Gatekeeper. And it says that some sort of policies. Basically, it says that cluster policy should only use LL volume types. So I deployed it on my Kubernetes cluster and it says that in this cluster, there are uncompliant pods which mount the host path. So let's look at these. For example, these containers. So secret stores CSI, this is our Kubernetes stack and blah, blah, metrics DB, metrics DC, flux config control. So these are the parts that are, that are not compliant in my environment. Either I can suppress it or I can add exclusion namespaces to exclusion list or I can take an action. Let's look at another policy. So it says that Kubernetes cluster should not, should not allow container privilege escalation. So let's look at the details of that, which didn't implement privilege escalation to, uh, I mean, allow privilege escalation to false. So these are the parts that should implement this feature. So what you should do is basically this privilege escalation and this one. Escalation. Where is that feature? I should find it. Let's specifically say, yeah, that one. Hello, privilege escalation to false. Under the specs, under the containers, under the security context, this property should be set to false. So it says that Cassandra didn't implement it. 
This is why gatekeeper open policy Kiverno is important. The other one is you can add trusted registries. And if somebody tries to deploy something from untrusted registry, you can audit it. Again, you can deny it. So let's look at the documentation again. Oh, let me remove it. Keyword, no? Scan for image. We, we mention it. Use a base image that's not explicitly allowed. We mention it. The software bill of materials, we mention it. Origin from untrusted registries. So it is related with the gatekeeper policies again. So scan, make the image as small, uh, make the image as small as you can. Use trusted registries. Scan the images. If there's a high vulnerability inside the containers, then try to understand it and try to elevate it. Blah, blah, blah. So these, these things are very important. So if you need any help on Cosign, to be honest, Batu Han is actually one of the Turkish guys who is maintaining this project and he's sharing lots of documentation based on Cosign. So he's absolutely great on this topic. And of course, he's working on Open Policy Agent as well. So a couple of videos of him. And then to be honest, I learned Cosign from him. So the other one is for today, I think the last one let's look, look at this one role based access control blah 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 primary authors mechanism scriptures and responsible for permission over resources so in this document in this page it says that for a moment let's think about this one you install something to manage your kubernetes environment you install jenkins or you install, let's say that, uh, Kube, um, Kube dashboard. And you're deploying something, you are removing something, you are, you are executing and managing your Kubernetes infrastructure through that environment. And it has a UI. And if the UI has remote code execution, because you are managing your Kubernetes cluster, and it should have cluster admin. So be careful about what you're deploying, what you are giving as, a, as permission. And if there's a vulnerability, like in the remote code execution, if you expose this dashboard to public, public spaces or in your internal environment, so bad intended per, people can elevate this one. So basically, don't expose everything to the internal users or to publicly available places, I mean, public internet. Before setting up your service account tokens, review the RBAC policies. So actually, for reviewing that, there's a very good um, crude plugin for that. So, okay. Proof search uh, grab Arbok. So K okay, proof Arbok review. This tool reviews your Kubernetes cluster Arbok permissions. I can I couldn't exact it. Run timer. Okay, let's try the other one. Arbok lookup. Wrong in my environment. But basically, these are the service accounts, and it shows you the roles of these service accounts. So be careful about that. For example, Flux some controller has a cluster admin. Why Flux controller has a cluster admin? I should review it. So Cassandra Flux supplier has cluster admin. Initially, I set it to show you. Or OMS agent, this is ours. OMS agent has OMS agent reader role, it's okay. Grafana has a Prometheus Grafana role, it's okay. So I should remove this one again, system masters. So I shouldn't do that because it's default one. So let's look at other one, it's okay. So I should remove why flux operator needs the admin permission in my cluster admin permission in my environment. 
and most of these uh, applications has the UI, right? And the attacker can access this UI. That's the yes. If there is a remote code execution, then everything will change. Because what if there is a remote code execution? Because the service token is mounted to the container. Container. Yeah. So if I mean it is mounted, so because it can download something from the internet. It will, he will or she will download the kubectl comment. So with the kubectl comment, he can do everything that he wants for my Kubernetes cluster as a cluster admin. Again, remote code, exec, remote code execution is very important. So that can be remote code execution, but I have to minimize the attack surface. So that's why in the not, net, not next session, maybe next uh thursday i we can we we can share kubernetes threat model so these are the things today i want to discuss i we finished 45 minutes and we just talked about how many of them three of them let's make it monday or tuesday i'm gonna share it from linkedin so we can continue the fourth fifth and the sixth one so do you have any questions or do you have any ideas? Let me look at the channel. Let's check the channel. And then maybe we can summarize the yeah. list. There are three comments in here. Cool. Is it these to be container level or the components, NPM? Both of them. I'm going to show you. Ah, uh, Ismet. Let's get my answers. Thanks. Yeah, I, I gave him answers. That's it for my site. And thank you so much. See you on Monday or Tuesday as well as on Thursday. Cool. Thanks so much, Vamish. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.